know, these tent parties they do make me wonder, like, who are they for? Are they for faculty, students, their families? Yeah. I mean, I feel like all of the above show up. Yeah. Any excuse for free food and everyone will come out of the woodwork. But, like, who's planning this? That's my question. Like, whose job is it? They came to MIT and they're like, okay, I am going to plan the most crazy party for the entire school. Like, who, who, is, who do you think is in charge of that? Um... I, I know a fun story. Yeah? My advisor, John Oxendorf, you guys know, mm -hmm. um, he he's like a pretty big name in the architecture department. Mm -hmm. And he the first thing he said to me when we first met was people normally know me as the guy who planned the 150 anniversary party. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the faculty around campus that take care of stuff like that. That's so crazy. So whoever's most relevant or closest to the person being celebrated. <laughs> so I guess for Rice Perhaps. party, it might have been like in his office, whoever works there, they would have done it probably. Wow. I feel like most faculty also have so many other jobs that they play <laughs> or a different role on campus mm -hmm. that they play. Everyone has to be involved in everything. Yeah. I don't know, imagine just being like um, a physics professor and because you're friends with someone, suddenly you have to throw a giant party. I mean, I don't think you'd really have to do all the planning and mm -hmm. all the minor things. There's definitely some department on campus that takes care of that. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, every time you have these parties, you see the same trucks outside, the same catering company, same tent company, mm -hmm. you know, peak event planning. Have you seen those trucks? I don't think so. Yeah. But every time it's that company. So, I mean, we have like several of these parties every year. So there's definitely some kind of established department that takes care of the major planning. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just a random like faculty gets enlisted to be the the to oversee the probably. overseer. It's funny. It must take a lot of um, design, you know. And actually, on that note, good after morning and welcome to On the Dome, a podcast about how non-expert college age youth think. And today, as my very unsubtle segue implied, we're actually going to be talking about design and architecture. And so, would you guys like to introduce yourselves? Yeah, hi, um, my name is Vicky, and I'm a course four here at MIT, uh, class of 2025, and I'm very excited to be on the podcast today. My name is Ning, I'm also a course four, class of 2025 at MIT, and I'm from Ningbo, China. I'm excited to be on the podcast. Hi, my name is Arusha, I'm also 25, uh, majoring in course four from New Delhi, India. Cool, very worldly group we have here. Um, so I guess that, I mean, the natural place to start is how did you guys get into design and architecture? Uh, so I would say I first got into design and architecture um, when I moved to Chicago. Mm -hmm. I um, did high school in Chicago, so I think I was exposed to a lot of architecture programs, extracurriculars. Obviously, Chicago is a big city for architecture. Mm -hmm. So I think from there, doing summer programs, all of that stuff, I just really got into design and this field and I thought it was really cool. I knew I wanted to go into it coming into MIT. So. I don't think I ever consciously made the decision to, yes, I'm going to do design. It was always just something that I did like, without mm -hmm. really thinking about it. Just art, you know, uh, or expressing myself with like objects around me. And I didn't consciously make that decision until it became time to apply for colleges and like decide what I want to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> and then it just was natural for me to choose architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I um, learned sculpture uh, for a long time in high school and I thought growing up I've always wanted to find um, a career path that's uh, not quite humanities focused but also not quite STEM focused mm -hmm. but like also has kind of both like best of both worlds and um, as I was learning sculpture, just something clicked in me that I wanted to do architecture. And I looked more into it. I went to some programs and found out that it's great. Yeah. I always think it's one of the, in some ways, it's one of the most appealing majors because it kind of combines everything that someone could be interested in. But also, it's definitely one of the scariest majors because, in my opinion, I feel like Course 4 is probably one of the hardest majors here. Um, course 4 being architecture and design. Because you guys have to do so much stuff. It's crazy. Uh, honestly, 
I think it's the easiest major, <laughs> but maybe that's because I find it the easiest. I think personally. it's because you like it. Though. Maybe maybe it's because I enjoy it. It is definitely like time intensive, mm -hmm. and I think one of the hardest things to understand in the beginning is that there is no right answer. Everything depends on you, how far you are willing to take your project. Mm -hmm. So, it's very self-defined. You're not like working towards a correct answer. You're just working with maybe no end goal in sight, just until you're satisfied. Mm -hmm. It's very open-ended. Yeah. Do you feel like your projects and your classes reflect that, or do they also make you do, do like something, like give you a vague prompt and then you have to figure it out from there? Yeah, that's something I really struggled with in the beginning when uh -huh. there's like no specificity in the assignments. Mm -hmm. And so you really don't have any guidance or structure. Like sometimes limitations help you be more, like help you create and think of ideas more easily because you're working within like some limits. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think? We have um, classes called design studios in which it's basically um, three or four hours, two or three times a week, depending on which level of studio mm -hmm. you are at. Um, and in those classes, it's mostly project based. You go to class, it's mostly like working on your project. You'll have desk critiques um, and then occasionally you'll get good feedback. But a lot of the times <laughs> you'll get a lot of you should change this. You should try this. Maybe do it this way. And um, I think, feel like just the learning, the way we learn is very different from, I guess, other courses or majors at MIT. Totally. It's not like you're sitting in lecture and you're writing down equations or anything. Mm -hmm. Although, I mean, maybe for physics classes that you have to do that. Like structural, <laughs> yes, I guess structural design classes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's like certain building technology classes that are more STEM heavy, mm -hmm. where you are exposed to the physics of how buildings interact with their environment, things like that. So do you guys want to be, I guess, architects specifically? Because, I mean, with design, you can kind of do anything. Mm -hmm. I think the goal for me is to definitely go into a traditional architecture, work at a firm. And, but for some other people, like, um, there's a more computational side to things that they'd rather explore. <laughs> I, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> but uh, ever since I decided I was going to do architecture, I've um, thought of becoming an architect. But um, uh, as I've looked into the career more, um, I don't want to sound opinionated, but uh, it's the architecture has seen better days, <laughs> the, the career in general. Mm -hmm. um, but so I'm uh, debating whether I should still become an architect uh, because I'm obviously still very passionate about it or mm -hmm. Uh, do something on the tangent of architecture and computation. Yeah, I think there's actually so many ways to get involved in architecture, even mm -hmm. if it's not the traditional path of being an architect at a firm. For example, like, I think, like, the field of building materials is very interesting. Mm -hmm. I could potentially see myself going into some sort of, like, bio-research for like cool. new bioengineered materials for buildings. Um, like but biomimicry and all of that? Yes, or cool. biodesign and biomimicry. I think that's very cool, but. Yeah, for anyone who doesn't know biomimicry, I'm gonna try and define it and correct me if I'm wrong. It's basically trying to look at different biological like processes and animals or plants or whatever, and then mimic them in either engineering or other technology. Yes? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My mom told me about that when I was 12, and I'm surprised I still remember. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's so many ways to, I mean, architecture in is obviously very much part of our everyday lives. We are in a building designed by an architect. We are always in like buildings, you know? But design is also extremely like, I mean, so we were in Design Plus, which is a first year learning community. Um, and I feel like one of the things that I took away from that is that just design is literally in everything. Mm -hmm. And so, prevalent in everything. I think it's actually funny you say we're in a building designed by an architect because like the majority of buildings in the world are not designed really? by architects. Yeah. Okay, I would say like 90-95% of the mm -hmm. buildings being constructed in the world are just made by construction companies or like mm -hmm. informally by people just making their houses. Like very very small percentage of buildings mm -hmm. are go through the proper design process and they tend to be a lot more expensive mm -hmm. and so you see it more in the developed world I would say. Totally, yeah. Most construction companies and real estate companies have templates for buildings. Mm -hmm. And because 
the legislative um, requirements for buildings are so harsh at some mm -hmm. places. Um, it's kind of hard to get approved for a special like architect design building anyways. Mm -hmm. And it's just more lucrative to for construction companies to follow the template and just fit it in the nooks and crannies of the sites and make it a building. So then Which is kind of sad. <laughs> totally, yeah. So then what, um, to you guys, defines the difference between like an architect? Maybe there's like there's a very specific thing, or maybe this is a very vague question, I don't know yet. But um, what defines like an architect design building versus just someone at it? Like what makes the person at the construction firm not an architect per se? Other than maybe the wrong major. <laughs> I, I would say just the intent yeah. of um, uh, all of us in architecture, we follow this one axiom and it's called form follows function. Mm -hmm. And form, as you know, is the, uh, the, the physical manifestation of the building mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it could re relate to aesthetic, could relate to um, geometry, uh, whatever uh, that's, that's physical. Mm -hmm. And function just refers to how the building is occupied and how it reacts to the environment and such and such. Um, and it's our job as architects to tie those two together, make the form intentionally catering to the functions, mm -hmm. but also make that process very in intentional. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, I would say, th this process is not... Uh, carried through in a lot of the template cookie cutter buildings. I think you could like apply to any manufacturing process, like what's art versus product, mm -hmm. right? Uh, like fine art sculpture versus um, like just a regular plate that's manufactured in the thousands. Mm -hmm. There is, like, of course, they both like have the same function. Yes, it's a dish, but one has some kind of artistry behind it, some kind of intention, mm -hmm. whether the other is purely just its purpose is to serve a function, be sold, be a product, and that's all. Totally. So, I mean, I feel like the word that is the word is intention. Um, do you feel like different architects? I'm. I'm. So, I feel like, at least from my understanding, different architects can sometimes bring like their one intention to all these different projects. Do you feel like you can kind of see different personalities? different architecture projects. Do you feel like you have an architectural personality yet? Not yet. <laughs> I think it's still <laughs> developing. But there are like so many examples of like very famous architects. Mm -hmm. All of their works, they won't be the same building obviously, but they'll follow certain themes that maybe reflect their personal philosophy or upbringing. Yeah, um, off the top of my head, I can think of maybe Renzo Piano. In a lot of his works, he tends to use like, very light, breezy effect on this like, facade of his buildings. Mm -hmm. such that it like replicates the image of a sail, like a, okay. you know, a boat. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to do with him like, growing up by the seaside in a coastal town. His father actually built ships, I believe. So like that kind of carries down. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of like personality, you know. Yeah. If you didn't know, the new BU building, this oh, blocky yeah, yeah, building yeah. is by Renzo Piano. Oh, cool. I've, I've been wanting to go into that building. I need to find an excuse to go over to BU. Yeah, and it's pretty it cool. Out. It's a very controversial building though. Some people don't like it very much. Yeah. I personally love it. I think it looks cool. Do um, you guys have any other opinions? Actually, this is something I really wanted to ask you guys about. What do you guys think of the buildings on campus? The MIT buildings? Oh, you just open a can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> Mixed feelings. For the most part, I tend to dislike most of the buildings on campus. Mm. Yeah. You want to call any out? <laughs> I know a lot of people come up to uh, Frank Gehry's Stata to, like, as, as tourists to take photos because it's such like an eye-catching, unique mm -hmm. building, but it has so many flaws, mm -hmm. and I almost, okay, I don't want to get like too heated about this, but <laughs> you know how he was saying form follows function? Right. That's just form, no function. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like, it work properly. Like the building should serve the people using it, mm -hmm. you know, like you should be able to easily navigate places. It shouldn't like overheat, it shouldn't leak water, uh, but that building does all these things. And it was also way over budget. Honestly, it looks kind of ugly and it's just all over the place. And I think uh, we yeah. sued them too, right? Like yeah. MIT sued. Yeah, I think oh, MIT really? sued, sued Gary's. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Because it, it wasn't a functional building. <laughs> I, I heard about, um, did you guys know the, the thing about the icicles? Um, 
No. I heard that, I think that this is true. Um, I heard that basically the doorways, they had to change the roofs um, that over, like that were hanging over the different entryways because the way that they were initially designed made it so that these giant icicles were forming right over the doors and they were like a real danger to people because like if one of them falls and the person under them is in some trouble. Exactly. So they had to redesign it to like, I think, I don't know, add a ridge or something so that ice wouldn't just be like forming on these yeah. diagonals. And, I think that building's a really good uh, example of how design, can, if it's just completely arbitrary and doesn't have any real like attention to detail, can lead to a lot of problems. You can't mm-hmm. just crumple a ball of paper and like say, okay, that's going to be my building, which is what some people believe Gary does. I don't think he actually does that. <laughs> I think um, I have a different opinion. Okay. I think the MIT campus is great mm-hmm. as an architecture student. And it's a very controversial opinion, I know. A lot of my peers in the department don't agree. But I think um, throughout the years, what MIT has tried to do is um, have um, provide an empty canvas for the masters in architecture. If you think about it, there's um, a lot of uh, big shots that have buildings at MIT, like throughout history, we have Ian Pei, we have uh, Frank Gehry, we have um, Stephen Hall, Alvar Alto, we have Saarinen. And th- all of them, I would say, somehow develop their style throughout th- their buildings at MIT. Mm-hmm. And we provided opportunities for them to experiment before they could um, have even bigger and more iconic projects. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them are flawed. And I personally live in, live in Simmons. And Simmons is, you know, I need to live in Simmons yeah. too. Simmons um, is a great building, but there are a lot of flaws in Simmons. Mm-hmm. But um, Stephen Hall himself developed his style. Um, you know, there's a very famous diagram of Simmons of, of mm-hmm. the light wells and yeah. how the building's dissected. And uh, this form of analysis was um, sort of the experiment that he was trying to go for. And I'd say it was more about the experimentation. Uh, And for me, at least, there's a lot of flaws, but I'm all for experimentation. Mm -hmm. And now MIT has become this like, kind of like a museum or like a Mm -hmm. gallery of of real life buildings that Mm -hmm. You know, some work really well, some might not, but it's a good, like, collection. Yeah, I never really thought about that way. Yeah, I think we strive to be a place of, like, many different creations where Mm -hmm. each, like, architect comes in and has their own, like, study they want to kind of, like, put into effect or this kind of new technique they want to try in their building. Mm -hmm. Um, And MIT like he said, is the place for it. So then we end up with a lot of very different but very unique Mm -hmm. and also pretty famous buildings around campus. And of course, they're not cohesive. um, But I think that's what MIT wanted. Less so of like a cohesive campus and more of... To contrast it to that other school down the street, Harvard. (laughs) um, I mean, I think that a lot of people, when they visit, like even friends of mine that have visited the area, they look at Harvard and they're like, oh my goodness, it's so pretty. It's all brick. It looks like it should be in the snow globe. But personally, I think that MIT is definitely more interesting. It's less uniform. It's less maybe like perfect and pretty, but it's very like interesting to like look at and also just live in these buildings. Going back to what you were saying, I also live in Simmons. I There's definitely flaws. There's definitely rooms that because of the, the way the walls are curved, half of the space is unusable. But... Um, I will say, I do think the lounges are really amazing spaces to be in. Um, we have these amazing like lounges that are like multi-floor, and some of them have big skylights, and they have these <coughs> curvy concrete, concrete walls. You should look up pictures if you haven't seen it. But um, it's just, it's very cool to be able to live in a sort of almost like a, it's almost like living in that architect's mind, in a way. Um, I don't know if I analyze it that much day to day, but um, it's just cool to see how a person would design a space and like really think about every part of it. Yeah. Like for, or not think about some parts of it. <laughs> <laughs> for people who don't know, Simmons was the, Simmons Hall was um, 
according to the amazing Paul Pettigrew, uh, a very <laughs> uh, one of the professors in our apartment, uh, was the most expensive dorm ever constructed when it was well, when it was constructed. It was not ever. 2002, so like I yeah. think it was it's as old as we are. First of all, yeah. <laughs> Simmons. Yeah, and I it, heard it, they picked the the architect that would do it for the cheapest. <laughs> what I heard. And it's also like. <laughs> It looks a lot newer than it. Oh, totally. Than it, than it, it feels is. pretty new. Yeah. And, and Baker, Baker Hall was the first dorm in America that's designed to be a college dorm. Mm. So other college dorms were designed in other styles like um, um, apartment buildings or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it would, the Baker was the first building intentionally to be used as a dorm. Um, it might not be the Meaning greatest MIT, layout, MIT? right? MIT? In America. That's interesting. I, th I think, according to the great <laughs> so Paul Pettigrew. So you're saying, interesting, that there's like no, that Baker House is the very first dorm to be made, constructed, to be used as a dorm. I think so. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, ask Paul Pettigrew. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting, but um, when you mentioned that, now I'm like starting to think of how all these buildings haven't really stayed the same. There have been a lot of renovations over the years, mm -hmm. and so the original intent or purpose behind some of these buildings might not be what we see now. Mm -hmm. For example, New House was like re renovated, I think. It was built in the 70s, but it was renovated after a flood, um, maybe 10 years ago, I'm not too sure. But you can see how they've shifted around the spaces and the rooms, because you have these mm -hmm. like, columns coming up out of nowhere. And some people might wonder if that's an improvement or not. Like, it, when you change the initial purpose of a space, does it still hold mm -hmm. up? Yeah. I wonder what the stud is going to look like. I'm oh, really I, yeah, that's, yeah. I feel like that's a big question on campus. I feel like they should just get another architect to, like, if they're going to fully redo it. Like, yeah. It would be cool to get someone else's take. I don't know if they're going to gut the inside completely or not. Mm -hmm. Like, will they remove the stairwells? Or? I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows. Yeah. I think they took a survey of mm -hmm. people, of the students, um, and they found that a lot of people really liked the look or the feel of Stud 5. Mm -hmm. So I think they're trying to replicate that throughout the entire building. Mm -hmm. They're adding more, like, music and art and dance facilities to, like, mm -hmm. I think third or fourth floors. I know they're adding dance studios. Um, and then, I don't know if you guys saw, there's like a huge boxed off area on the first floor of Stud. Do you yeah. guys know what that's going to be? No idea. In next to Tito? Yeah. The, the middle. Maybe uh, like an atrium? I hope. <laughs> Have you guys? Because I, I don't think it's possible to punk punctuate through that. <laughs> Concrete, like we already have an atrium. So, for right. context, for any of our listeners, the stud is our student center, and it's correct me if I'm wrong. Brutalist architecture. Yes. It's so, which basically is, to to my knowledge, characterized by big cement blocks. Yes. Um. So it's a little bit. I feel like it's a little controversial on campus. I think a lot of people think it's ugly. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so while I said I don't really like MIT's campus as a whole. I actually like the stud. <laughs> I think it has really beautiful moments, like uh, the Lovedale dining hall, where you have like a double height um, windows and ceilings, where you have this a like, great view of the lobby seven across the street. That's you, the the big like the big dining hall. dining hall. Yes, mm -hmm. I think that's a beautiful room. The um, biggest issue with the stud, I say, is lack of sunlight. Mm -hmm. So the rooms with windows are ten out of ten, but then every other space is just very claustrophobic. Mm -hmm. So, but from the outside. I think the stud is really lovely. It has these clean lines and symmetry. And personally, I like brutalism if it's done well. Mm -hmm. And I think the stud is a good example. I mean, I don't know enough about brutalism to say whether it's a good example or not. But I don't know. I think that's I. I do know that I've heard that students don't like it. Like I've heard a lot of people say they don't like it. I'm neutral on the stud. I think. I think it's just one of many oddballs on MIT campus. I think once you go to Harvard's student center, <laughs> you understand why maybe <laughs> students don't like it. Because yeah. Harvard's student center, I forget what it's called, but it was voted or like it was awarded as the best interior space in Boston. Oh, good. Very recently. It's the one that's with all the giant glass windows. The huge yeah. atriums with trees yeah. inside. Yeah. I mm. have been there um, to get my um, Harvard ID card, which is 
sort of a thing that all of my friends in my friend group did is one by one we all made our way over to Harvard and got, you can get a Harvard library card, which looks pretty similar to a Harvard ID card. Mm -hmm. We were all getting them. It is a very, like, pretty space to be in, very yeah. glass and light and all that. Mm -hmm. I would say for the stud, um, the interior really doesn't match the exterior. Mm -hmm. And that's, I like Arusha was saying, I also love the exterior of the stud and how many layers, the circulation is very, if done well, if the interior is planned well, the circulation could be very multi-dimensional. Mm -hmm. There are um, ways you could traverse around from the outside, inside and such, but it looks very like, um, how should I say this? Like, like middle schooly? In, on, the in, inside? on the inside yeah all the linoleum and plastic yes. and like a flickering fluorescent light <laughs> and, and yeah i see what yeah. you mean and there's a it could be a lot more occupiable mm -hmm. spaces in the stud and about sunlight i don't think there's much <laughs> that can be done the concrete's concrete it's there okay. yeah i think there is something can, that can definitely be done with stud five yeah because stud five has these amazing windows that wrap all around, mm -hmm. but then right outside is like a concrete wall. So there's absolutely no point. You can't see mm -hmm. outside the windows. Yeah. So they need to do something right. about that. Wait, I think the student center is like a historical building. Mm -hmm. It used to be like a fort or something is what I heard. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they wanted to maintain the facade. It was like the original or close to the original facade of the fort, which is why you have the, the wall with the tiny windows like that, a little crenellations oh. yeah which is why they Battle don't want to take it down they need to preserve it okay Damn. so no no view from the window okay yeah they should invent like they should invent a material where it looks um like concrete from the outside but it's the <laughs> glass on the inside <laughs> one-way concrete yeah one-way concrete um actually that brings up another thing in terms of interior design um i feel like i always notice and um, this is common in like high schools and um middle schools and even like in some buildings here th these like very specific this very specific shades of like blue green and orange it's like a like a light green like like new vassar blue and then like the like orange yeah. that and they're always like these like very generic like primary colors yeah, yeah the even in hayden you see a lot of just green yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. what do you guys think of those colors i don't really like it it feels so corporate and plastic to yeah. me i prefer like warm wooden tones maybe mm -hmm if you want to go for that, or like just, if you want a more industrial clean look, silver or gray, like maybe mix up the materials a lot more, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, one room that I really love that is, I feel like does that sort of clean colors with a few pops, um, it's very messy right now, but it's this room. I feel like, it's, and this building in general, it, I feel like it's like black and white with yellow as sort of the like pop of color, and I feel like it's really nice. I love this space. Obviously, I chose mm -hmm. to film the podcast here. Yeah, this building looks so gross from the outside. It's like an industrial warehouse. Mm -hmm. But then you come inside and it's actually super warm and cozy and all the furniture works mm -hmm. with whatever's left behind from the warehouse days. Yeah, it's a very, very nice place to be in. I feel like there are a lot of spaces in MIT like that where even though maybe from the outside it looks like one way, there's a lot of spaces here that are very designed for like just the experience of being in them. Um, and I think that that maybe comes from like the whole like men's and modest thing where we're not only mine but like working with our hands a lot of these like more functional spaces are sometimes even more like nice to be in some of the the lounges or the designed spaces mm -hmm. yeah i kind of agree with that like students who just make the space their own mm -hmm. versus the, a prescribed like this is where you're supposed to hang out the space mm -hmm. i see that form and function i guess yeah <laughs> um I'm trying to think if there are any other notable buildings on campus to discuss. I mean, I guess the whole um, main campus with like the dome and Killian Court and all of that is also a very like iconic part of MIT. Yeah, iconic and actually surprisingly recent. Mm -hmm. Like the, it comes off as a lot more ancient and old than it actually right. is. Yes. The columns. It was 1900s, I want to say, like yeah, 1910. Yeah, 1920s. So it's really not that old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite buildings on campus, although like, pretty recently, since mm -hmm. I discovered it pretty recently, is the Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Mm, yeah, the sixth floor? Yeah, not only the plant lounge, but just the atrium with the different staircases Which and the floors. 
It's like on Vassar Street. It's Pickover Center. Oh, the Pickover Center. Yeah. They were, like, I think that, they, didn't they, like, just build it when we came in as freshmen? Yeah, I think so, yeah. it opened mm-hmm. our freshman year. I don't think I've been inside. Should it's, yeah, you should beautiful. go. <laughs> I think it's the first building on MIT campus where I was actually, I was like, wow. I was <laughs> like, this is, this architecture is crazy. Mm-hmm. However, every time I've gone in there, it's been kind of empty. Have you noticed it's that? It's very empty. It's very yeah. empty. Like, there's no people walking around in the balconies. It's usually mm-hmm. just you. <laughs> and I feel like if I spoke, my voice would like echo across the chamber. So I wonder what the experience of that building would be like if it was actually very busy and people were using it. Right. I feel like some of the most interesting and unique places on campus are kind of these like places that aren't very, like, people aren't there a lot or no people don't know about. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, MIT definitely has a lot of secret hidden spaces. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I brought up one thing uh, that's not really commonly known about architecture. Um, normally, an architect's job is not finished until like a couple years after the project is done oh. because all, all the surveying and looking at how the space is finally occupied. And that's also, um, unbeknownst to a lot of people, one of the trickiest parts of architecture because you never know what the building will actually be like until you've seen people inside the building for a long time. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's also this big debate, is is it the architect's job to impose how the building's occupied or is it the people who's occupying the building's job to use it as their own? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. this debate kind of also is really important for the architect to learn how they could um, for their next projects, better know about the uh, the, the the demographics and the, uh, how the spaces will be occupied, and um, some architecture friends I've I've known uh, say that that's actually one of the hardest parts of being an architect because mm-hmm. um, you might receive um, like very bad feedback, but at that point there's for that specific building, there's not much you can do about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, it's a, uh, it's very, in, in a sense, it's like one shot, one opportunity. <laughs> Architects are often also like on site while the building is being constructed to make sure mm-hmm. that everything goes correctly, that like this wall that they wanted is not accidentally pushed like one foot to the left and it needs to mm-hmm. be or like a fixture that needs like an outlet there or a wire there is like Mm -hmm. input there and not like maybe like a few feet away where it would change, I guess, the look of the inside. Mm -hmm. So I think there's still very involved throughout the entire process. Mm -hmm. And it can be stressful, I guess, to like have construction workers that are like kind of trying to finish it the most efficient way possible, Mm -hmm. but you need it to be exactly how you designed it a lot of stuff to consider that's i mean that's why i said i said earlier that i think architecture is one of the hardest majors here i still think that because um there's just so many considerations you have to be artistic and know design you have to like know the mathematics of how everything fits together and the mechanical engineering of how it all fits together and the physics of the materials and the material science of the materials and then also all the civil and structural so there's just so many considerations and obviously it's not one person doing this one person has to know a lot of stuff a lot of us in the department uh, <coughs> have considered double major in mm-hmm. other majors and it's it our minds go wild because we can find connections between architecture and any major mm-hmm. so i've heard some of us want to major in material science mm-hmm. a lot of us are considering civil engineering and um, planning, really planning. Mm-hmm. obviously planning and architecture are, are a lot more closely related uh, business management. Business management goes to architecture. Like me personally, I'm double majoring in AI, mm-hmm. and all the majors, even like political science, or just pick a major. You can find something that goes with architecture, and that's one of the hard things. And also, is the beauty of architecture. Mm-hmm. I think what's interesting in architecture is when you are actually an architect, a practicing architect you learn so many random things about different careers based on 
the building you're building mm. <laughs> for that career. Like, for example, you work in, like, the healthcare segment of architecture. You're building hospitals. You learn so many things about, like, how big a room needs to be to, like, fit, like, an MRI mm -hmm. through the doorway to get it in. Or, like, what spaces need to be where for how, like, a hospital works. And you just have, like, lots of tiny bits of information about many different things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the essence of architecture. Like, even architecture, the discipline itself, like, we talked about, it was a little bit of, like, math, a little bit of art, a little bit of, like, engineering, a little bit of, like, honestly... Anything like sustainability, public speaking, to public speaking. Public, is that so important? So much business finance. management, yeah, because yeah. that goes into a building too. Oh, Law, money, <laughs> money is such a big thing, mm -hmm. and like building codes, building, yeah, like regulations. You just kind of have to know every major a little bit, a little yeah. bit, yeah. You know how you were earlier, okay, it's kind of a tangent, but you were saying, like, architecture students dress a certain way. Yeah, I, I did say that. Yeah. I said that I was cosplaying as an architecture student today. <laughs> so I think that kind of comes back to, we're learning how to present things to the world. Mm -hmm. Like, not only the building, but the idea of the building. You have to learn how to present it and sell it to people. So that people, like, believe your idea and that it's good. They see what mm -hmm. you're seeing. So, to, like, to share your vision. I don't know if that has anything to do with why architecture students care about how they are dressed yeah <laughs> i feel like architecture majors care more about i guess expressing Aesthetics. themselves yeah. in different ways whether it's through architecture dressing themselves mm -hmm. decorating their rooms yeah even oh yes like the every course for students room that i've seen has been like Wow. Oh, you haven't seen my room. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> Keep it that way. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think one of the uh, popular, like, sayings about architects, mm -hmm. we're all black, uh, relates to the, the concept of architecture, of, of form being more important than, like, color, for example. Because I feel like wearing all black is presenting yourself through the form of your clothes rather than using color as a uh, a main mm -hmm. like as the most important criteria and I, I see that in a lot of architecture because as you were saying the the, the corporate colors um, that's I think that's one of the things I, I'm not very knowledgeable about interior design mm -hmm. but I think that's one of the things to avoid is dictating a space using a color because color is a very opinionated thing. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody has different feelings about uh, different colors and it's rather the, the form that's that's uh, could be more malleable and, and more neutral uh, for a space and that ties into like how architects mm -hmm. present themselves as a design project <laughs> per se. Um, treating themselves as like a, a, a form <laughs> how, how to describe it. Right, yeah, to build on that, like when you design something, it's not just color. There's like material, there's texture, there's like the layout of it, the composition, like whether your mm -hmm. shirt hits at like one third of your whole body or like mm -hmm. two thirds of your whole body, proportions. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I don't think like architecture students like sit down and analyze their outfits like that. It's more of a subconscious thing. I, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. you're so used to thinking about everything this way and perceiving yeah. the world constantly. Like, you know, when I, I'm just walking around anywhere, I feel like a tourist because I'm always trying to analyze whatever's around me. And it's subconscious mm -hmm. at this point. I don't know if you guys feel that way ever. I would say that like sometimes when I'm walking around like a city, I feel like the joy I feel out of like witnessing a new building is definitely not or it's definitely way greater than some of my peers, which I yeah. find interesting. <laughs> like, I sense. see this building, I'm like, this is so cool. And some of my friends will be like, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> and I'll be like, this is so cool. But they probably wouldn't have even noticed it unless you said that. Yeah. yeah. Or they wouldn't have noticed, like, a specific thing. Like, the way the light hits it and, like, makes it, I don't know, reflective in a certain way. Mm -hmm. It's cool that for your major, you get to kind of see examples of your craft or maybe how your craft can like kind of not be used or be used pretty much everywhere you All go. All the time. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't really walk down the streets and be like, oh my goodness, that algorithm. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there's not really that many visual examples. I mean, 
you could you, if you think about it, you can think of like oh the Amazon Web Services used to run this cashier station. But again, so much of that is corporate and not I guess um, I guess artistic or even like. I guess intentional. Like, I, I feel like a lot of computer science that's in our day-to-day -day lives is very much corporate. Mm -hmm. So it's harder to see like, I don't know, the beauty of and the elegance of all of it. Um, in some ways, maybe that's, I guess it's like kind of like math. There's, I feel like there's a lot of um, emphasis on elegance and like, I don't know, the design of it all in architecture and in math. Look at that beautiful equation. Look at that beautiful <laughs> building, same thing. Beautiful proof. <laughs> Any other buildings on campus that you guys like? Uh, the chapel. Chapel is yeah. great. I like the chapel. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Sometimes I go in there just to sit for a bit, like, it calms me down. Like, it's very effective at what it does. It's a beautiful building. Yeah. I only went in there for um, Navratri last year, I went. Um, but, yeah, it's, I don't know, just, and the way that, like, the sound is in there, mm -hmm. too, um, because there were, like, people were doing different, um, like they were singing different things, like I sang a Therana, some girls sang um, a Carnatic piece. And so just like, I don't know, the sound and the light and like just that whole, and also it being circular, mm -hmm. very yeah. cool. Very nice experience to be in there. And I think it's even better if you go alone. Try going there alone sometime. Mm -hmm. It really feels like a spiritual experience just with you and your thoughts. You can't really see the outside world at all. Yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think about the new... Uh... Music building? Let's talk about the. Building? Let's talk about the. <laughs> so many let's new let's start on somewhere. Somewhere less risky. Okay, let's, yeah, let's talk about. Let's that. talk about the competition building. Oh, this that is being built on master. Yeah, the shorts, mm -hmm. but yeah. I haven't really looked at it that closely. It's like the layered glass. Like oh, glass. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think it. I mean, if it's gonna be all glass, I guess it'll go well with Pickerwork because it's right next to it. There's so many buildings, because I thought you were going to talk about the grad housing building that's next to Simmons. Oh, yeah, I mean, I don't <laughs> know what it looks like. Yeah, so. Or the Met Warehouse. I, the one thing I yeah. heard about that that was interesting is um, one of um, my friends in ARP Air Club, he was like, I really wonder what they're going to do. I really hope that they don't do something too obvious with the window size, because he was saying one of the cool things about Simmons, it has very tiny one foot by one foot, or a little bigger than that, like a one and a half foot by one and a half foot windows that make Simmons look really, really big. It's the scale, yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. so he was saying, I really hope they don't just put some ordinary building next to it and ruin the sense of um, scale. Yeah. <coughs> but yeah have, Simmons like, looks really window. tall from far away. Yeah. Also, because yeah. it kind of stands in isolation. It looks kind of like a, like a little city to me, or like even like a, like a ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm actually um, doing a project for my 422 mm -hmm. design class and the building I picked was Simmons mm -hmm. and we're doing a bunch of like tests on resolution for this building and like you don't realize how many windows Simmons has until you have to like model all of the <laughs> windows and it's like I think there's like almost like 30 going from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's three per floor right. so, and 10 floors. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. There's 18 windows in my room. Last year, my room was at, at a corner, uh -huh. and it was a double. That room had like 32 windows or something. <laughs> wow. Although, I am not a fan of the many windows. I feel that, like, one of like my favorite uses of a window is to stare out the mm -hmm. window. Or, like, have the sunlight come in. Mm -hmm. But when you have so many tiny windows, you don't get much sunlight mm -hmm. coming it's in. Difficult. You also have less of an ability to look outside mm -hmm. with yeah. that window. And you have to imagine opening 32 curtains in the morning yeah. and then closing. Yeah. I just bought this big curtain. Mm -hmm. So I, oh, it sorry. covers four windows. And I have those four always, the curtains always open. So I just slide it back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like most people in Simmons, their curtains don't move. They just yeah. are like, the amount of light, like, like literally when you walk into the room, wherever the curtains are, that's just what it is for the rest of the year. <laughs> yeah. Or like, I have, um, one window that I use and then my roommate has one window that she uses and so like if we want to like stand by the window and look out or if we like want to open a window it'll be that one. <laughs> yeah like a little bit of I kind of like it I think it's just I just think it's interesting I like interesting like spaces it, it's not very like efficient necessarily yeah. but I think it looks cool from the outside and it gives them I don't know it certainly gives a sense of space to the rooms it gives like a personality to the yeah. rooms. Mm -hmm. 
I would rather have that than like a really cookie cutter, you know, white eight by ten foot room with two twin beds and identical dressers and you can just say new bathroom. <laughs> new bathroom. <laughs> I would say you say. Yeah. No, but I think here's my argument for living in less than perfect environment in when you're in college. Because you're gonna have the rest of your life to live wherever you want in a normal house. This is the one time in your life you're gonna have to put up with it. And so it's okay, you know? Like I'm living in a house that's extremely old. It's like a frat it's a frat house. So it's it's less than ideal. It has a lot of issues. I think my window is single pane. <laughs> so I it gets overheated. But then I think about it. I should appreciate it while I can, you know, the messy floors and the creaking stairwell. Because I probably will never experience this substandard of living ever again. Yeah. <laughs> Although, Arusha, I've been to your room. Her room is really nice. It's a huge, like, single. It's not a single. It's a split double. I have a roommate who goes through my room to get to their room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they're never there, right? But he is always there. Okay. I just haven't seen him. <laughs> <laughs> but we get along well. It's because so. he's in all black. It's in the shadows. Oh, yeah. <laughs> No, it's really funny. His Batman. room, yeah, his room is completely different. So you can see our personalities mm-hmm. just across the hallway. We have so a couple of my friends have a split double sort of <coughs> situation in Simmons. It's not exactly the same. It's basically like a room that is divided by this wall, and it has like a little doorway, and so there's kind of two little almost you can you could make it two apartments. What they have instead chosen to do is have the back room be a sort of bunk room, and they've lofted their beds and like put all their closets and stuff back there and that's where they sleep and then the entry is this like living room with this giant rug that all of us go and work on which is very nice. In Simmons? Yeah, in Simmons. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. It's not a super big room but based on because they've like put all put all of the like living sort of stuff crammed into that back room, the front room is really nice. Mm. Talking of like interesting rooms. Um so I live in Baker mm-hmm. and um I think one big feature of Baker is that I think there's like, you know, the shape, it's like very curved. Yeah. There's this kind of like wave shape. Um, with that, they, um, Alvar Alto designed each of the rooms to be kind of different. So you have like the rooms that are straight. And then when you get to the curve, you have rooms that are kind of pie shaped or mm-hmm. wedge shaped to match like the mm-hmm. curve. Um, and I think it's very interesting because he has to design all of the furniture to match Mm-hmm. I guess, a non-90 degree straight right angle room. Mm. Um, and previously, I lived in one of those like straight 90 degree rooms. But next year, I'm living in one of those like wedge shaped mm-hmm. rooms. And they have like a triangular desk. <laughs> and then like the bed kind of like against the wall. And I'm like very excited to see mm-hmm. what it's like to live in a room that is... I custom guess furniture. not a square, yeah. It's always so exciting to see custom furniture. Yeah, but then that means you can't really move it around, can you? If a desk is designed to be a certain way in that corner. You, okay, yeah. You can't really move much stuff around in Baker. A lot of stuff is attached to the wall. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, they're very, like, strict about it. Since this is, like, original furniture from when Baker was designed. Mm-hmm. Um, Probably really expensive. <laughs> yeah. Because, just because it's attached to this project. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know Oliver Alto himself was really passionate about just product design in general. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys seen, he has these very famous curvy glasses. I don't think so. That uh, <coughs> people, uh, they're kind of like bulbous, mm-hmm. but they're like extrusions of uh, just like <laughs> straight vertical extrusions. It's hard to explain, search them mm-hmm. up, okay. but they're really cool. Yeah, a lot of architects actually do product design, furniture design. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, two things on that. Number one, it's it sounds like Baker is kind of the opposite of Simmons in that way because Simmons has all these really weird um, rooms and sometimes with curvy walls. And the furniture is the same in every room, but it's modular. So you can change it a lot. But sometimes it's very annoying because th- th- there's like a certain wall that will be like, four inches too short for you to put your bed (laughs) against the wall um or like the curvy wall will be like just at the right angle so that your desk cannot fit anywhere Mm -hmm. um i actually got rid of my desk in my room my desk is in the the lounge next door to me because i was like there's no (laughs) place that i can put it with the layout of my room um and then the other thing i was thinking about you said that a lot of architects go into furniture design i'm taking a furniture making class right now and on the first day 
our teacher went through a slideshow of chairs throughout history, like starting with King Tut's chair and like going forward. And I think at one point he, we got to the 50s and he was like, and this is the point where architectures, like architects started making chairs and started ruining the chair design industry. <laughs> and like he would just go through and be like, this chair was made by this architect. It's terrible. These are the reasons why. <laughs> um, I'm sure that a lot of architects are great at designing chairs. Um, but he was he was making fun of them a little bit, which was funny. I think a lot of the architects use chairs and furniture and small scale things to experiment with <laughs> idea and form mm -hmm. without it necessarily being super functional. Mm -hmm. It's just better to make the mistakes on a chair than a building. You know? yeah. Yeah. A lot Very of true. architecture design chairs look super uncomfortable, <laughs> but uh, they're really famous, yeah. um, and uh, some of them are pretty successful. Like um, Le Corbusier has this. Uh, a, a, a French architect, very famous, has this uh, like cushioned uh, lounge chair kind of mm -hmm. that uh, is copied all over the world. Yeah, and I, I think there's a big disparity between architects and artisans mm -hmm. that uh, um, they're, these types of, of people both are really passionate and, and knowledgeable about their craft, but in different ways. Mm -hmm. And artisanship is more uh, like tradition, like heritage focused, and a lot more... Um, more of like perfecting a specific perfecting, craft. Yeah. yeah, in our furniture making class, um, I was um, trying to like basically cut a joint out of um, a piece of my chair, and my teacher handed me this little tool that was essentially these two nails, very, very tiny nails, set exactly half an inch apart. And there's a little like clamp so you could set it to, and then score exactly where you wanted the piece to be. And he was like, be careful with that. It's an antique, um, like essentially um, scorer. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, or like the, the saw that we're using is Japanese and you can't put it in this way. Like it's very, it's very emphasis on your tools too, which is really cool. Yeah, I've also found myself like falling into the furniture design when I get really frustrated, like I can't really do anything. All I'm doing is like clicking buttons on Rhino. And so sometimes I come here to this building and just get scrap wood, build a shelf. And that's like an outlet, you know, like, oh, I'm okay, I'm good now. Yeah. I wonder if um, like every course for major has had like some issue and they're like, what if I made something? to fix this issue. Like I have this tiny corner of my room mm -hmm. that's unusable. And I've had definitely had the thought, what if I made a shelf? Yeah. Oh yeah, I've done that all what the time. What if you make a custom shelf to fit the one curve in Simmons? Or yeah. <laughs> I've, yeah, definitely thought about that, but I've I'm, actually put uh, it into practice. Finish my project first. <laughs> so where I live, we don't really have like uh, furniture that's given to you, like it's given to you in a dorm. So you kind of just have to figure it out. So I've made a lot of custom furniture for my own room. That's awesome. Yeah. I really want to make a shelf for right above my bed. The problem is um, the shelf would have to be mounted on the concrete. And so then oh. like I went like, down a rabbit hole of how can I like mount a shelf that's still like weight bearing to concrete without drilling into the concrete and losing my deposit. <laughs> but um, no, definitely. And that's definitely a thing in MIT is like anything that it's like with the mind enhancing, it's any problem you're like, how can I think my way out of this? And, or how can I make my way out of this? <laughs> Maybe that's why we have so many, like, course planning websites. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, although all, all of it just comes back to, you know, we, I feel like at MIT, and especially from what you guys were saying through architecture, you're, like, given a way of, like, seeing the world and seeing all the intention that goes into it. And I think, yeah, it just cultivates that same intentionality in all of us. So, on that note... Thank you so much for listening, and this has been On The Dough. See, I like, I try to have something like cool for the ending. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> yeah.